with me. I should start uh, by saying that my perspective on the standard historical music appreciation text is a bit different from the one that you heard from Jennifer through Mary. I just wrote a book that rejects the historical narrative as an organizing principle, but maintains a focus on the Western classical canon. I did this for a variety of reasons. Most schools now have separate courses on world and popular music. So in my experience, students do expect to be taught Western classical music in the music appreciation course. Mostly, though, I wanted to write a book with a clear and coherent voice. And to me, that meant presenting the music I know best while focusing on developing listening skills rather than on history. I devoted most of the book to musical elements, form, timbre, rhythm, and so forth, which most other books discuss only briefly. I decided to bring the same pieces back repeatedly in the course of the book so students would get to know them from multiple perspectives. I also resolved that no music would be ghettoized, that is, separated into a section of the book that would be easily ignored. Whatever music I included had to be fully integrated into the text as a whole. I like to think that I produced a book that will inspire students to take music seriously, and to me, that is a far bigger issue than what kind of music it covers. What I'm here to talk about today, though, are the challenges of getting publishers, reviewers, and adopters to consider a book that is self-consciously different from the norm. For as long as I can remember, there have been complaints about the fact that few such books are available, that someone who wants to teach an introductory course in an unorthodox way either has to work around the standard text or do without them. If you've ever been in that position and wondered why there aren't more options on the market, I'm here to give you the author's eye view. And interestingly, I will say many of the same things Chris just said, except from the, uh, the uh, a perspective of the person who writes rather than the one who, uh, who edits and publishes. Writing a textbook, I've learned, is a fundamentally different experience from what most academic authors are accustomed to. There is no academic freedom. Your writing may be positively reviewed for content and quality, but what matters is whether it will sell. Every publisher wants you to rewrite the last successful book. Music appreciation is such a huge market, it might seem that publishers could afford to offer a greater variety of textbooks, but actually the opposite is true. In order to compete in this market, a book has to be expensively produced and come with an extensive package of ancillaries. Few publishers want to make a large investment in something that may fall flat. It is understandable that they prefer to follow a formula that has already proven successful for other books. The standard chronological survey, what we've come to call music history light, is such a formula. As I have argued elsewhere, music history light made sense for the college students of the 1950s, most of whom had some familiarity with classical music and expected to learn more about it in a college course. For reasons that Jennifer has already summarized, it doesn't make much sense for college students of today. Nevertheless, the formula continues to be imitated because books based on it have sold well in the past. A book with a novel approach, on the other hand, must first pass through a gauntlet of skeptical reviewers, and this is where the monolithic past collides with the multicultural present. A lot of instructors may want a different kind of book, but what kind of book they want depends on their own widely varying interests and backgrounds. It simply isn't possible to write a book that will appeal to everyone who is dissatisfied with the traditional approach. But that is exactly what a publisher willing to take a chance on such a book has to hope for. If reviewers simply indicate that they find the premise of a proposed new book intriguing, that's not enough to get it off the ground. Meanwhile, institutional requirements present a different kind of obstacle. Very early in the genesis of Take Note, it became clear that many reviewers were given no choice but to teach the music appreciation course chronologically, or at least to include a substantial amount of historical content. When at least a third of potential adopters tell you in survey responses that they would not be able to adopt the book you are proposing to write even if they wanted to, then you have to propose a different book. I originally intended to write Take Note with no chronological content at all, but it soon became clear that the market would not allow that to happen. 
Many schools, we found out, also have other content requirements that are non-negotiable, and these can be hard to reconcile with each other. Ironically, though, these problems were relatively easy to solve in a book that didn't try to cover everything. If you include Beethoven but not Brahms, Debussy but not Schoenberg, then you can't be faulted for including Gamelon but not Gagapu. A more serious problem was the attachment that veteran instructors developed to particular pieces. I was a bit startled by the number of reviewers who refused to consider a book that didn't include the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, Chestnut Self, and my failure to include this one probably cost me several adoptions, as did the omission of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. However, I probably more than compensated for these losses by including significant works for wind ensemble, band, percussion, and choir, which, as we all know, are underrepresented in the standard text. The advice I have for anyone who wants to write a novel music appreciation text, and there is certainly room for many more of them, is to know what makes your book unique and not back down on that, but be realistic about everything else. You will have to make compromises if you are going to make it to press, but you also have to know what can't be compromised. Your voice has to come through. The rationale for the book has to be compelling enough that people will be willing to give it a second and third look. The writing has to draw people in. You must own and inhabit the examples you write about, which means they must be ones you have chosen carefully and that you long for students to hear. These are qualities, qualities that reviewers will recognize and respond to with enthusiasm, even if they don't agree with all the choices you've made. Once the book is accepted and published, the focus shifts to finding potential adopters. And here, the biggest challenge is inertia. Asking veteran instructors to abandon the chronological framework amounts to asking them to redesign their syllabi from scratch. There is also an attitude among some administrators that music appreciation is a course that anybody on the faculty should be able to teach, often on very short notice. If the program uses adjunct instructors, administrators may prefer that they use a tried and true format, and adjuncts and occasional teachers of the course may themselves be reluctant to go out on a limb with an unfamiliar approach. Shifting from a historical approach to a skills-based one like that used in Take Note also raises the perpetual question, how do I test this? Since appreciation is often taught in very large sections, testing methods that require more open-ended responses are a hard sell. Yet these are exactly what is needed to make sure students haven't simply memorized rote content. Meanwhile, once chronology no longer serves as the backbone of the semester, classes have to be redesigned to include more listening <clears throat> practice and heightened student involvement. Anticipating these issues, I conceived of Take Note as a multimedia text that takes full advantage of current technology. The electronic listening guides were designed not just to describe what students were hearing, but to give them full access to the music in real time so they can both see and hear as much as possible, whether or not they know how to read standard music notation. My publisher, Oxford, produced a website that presents all the listening examples in streaming format, which is what we found students overwhelmingly want. It's the instructors who want to see set, but they're the only ones who will buy it, and of course they get it for free. Uh, I wrote an instructor's manual that included suggestions for engaging students based on my own experience teaching this material and included simple but effective test questions on, questions on listening skills, many of them multiple choice. I want to conclude by suggesting that changing the way this course is taught isn't just the textbook author's job. It's a collaborative effort. My class shouldn't look like your class. Anybody who uses Take Note and wants to teach the Symphonie Fantastique should just go ahead and do it. The piece practically teaches itself, which is why it's in so many books. <clears throat> if you want to teach other kinds of music that aren't covered in the text, let your light shine forth. This is the best way for students to apply what they're learning about musical elements throughout the course. The advantage of a non-chronological approach is that it lets you do that at any point in the semester, not just at the end. If you've ever felt like the only options available were to work around the standard text or to do without one, there is a third choice. 
you can choose a non-standard text, one that speaks with a unique personal voice, and teach from it in the same spirit, blending your voice with the author's. Chances are, yours is the one that students will remember long after their used copy of the textbook has started making the rounds on Amazon. Thank you. <laughs> this many people in the audience. Um, so I think that my talk is going to dovetail quite nicely with what Robin has just said because I have done just that. Um, um, as many of you in this room teaching music appreciation courses has been a part of my teaching load at, at each of the institutions where I have been employed. Until two years ago I primarily taught these courses in, in face to face during the fall or spring semester of the academic year. My choice of textbook depended on the student population. Um, but the approaches I chose were chronological. So I've used Mockless, The Enjoyment of Music, I've used Kamian, and I've used Carmen's Listen. Um, at my current institution, Appalachian State in Boone, I teach this course only in the summer. And for two summers I taught face-to-face. -face. But as many of you may have experienced, um, enrollments in summer courses, have, have, in face-to-face -face courses, have dwindled due to other online options, and in Boone's case because it's challenging for students to live during the summer in a resort town. It becomes much more expensive. So our dean, along with many other deans and chairs, have looked to um, uh, creating online courses for gen ed classes to boost enrollment numbers. So I worked with a cohort of faculty, um, music faculty, to create online offerings. And we were assigned with a learning technology specialist for assistance and spent about four months working collaboratively for that. So as I explored pedagogy and lurked in available MOOCs um, on music, I realized the importance of design for the su success of the course. Our summer sessions um, are five weeks, so the design needed to be sleek and quickly understood, but also include ways for students to engage personally with, um, with each other, along with the material, and to have some choice in order to engage and, and have some choice about what they were studying. Um, in order to engage students in an online course, and engagement was a very important uh, topic for me. Uh, it's uh, something that I feel that I do very well in a face-to-face -face class. So I felt it a challenge for me to do this in an online um, situation. I found pro providing students with various styles of music and ways of thinking about music through topics to match my own goals for the course and the interests interest of the students. Students do not experience music chronologically, but by music that they are interested in or passionate about. And I just heard Tim Rice last weekend do a presentation on a music history um, uh, book that he's working on and used the metaphor of roots and looking at music that's in the present and thinking about the roots of those, of those pieces. Um, so for me, uh, Notvig and Cornelius' book, Music, A Social Experience, worked well with the way I was conceiving of the course design. I used the chapter headings uh, from the text to create, create uh, uh, modules for the course. So this is what the course looks like. And so this is not all of the chapters from the book, but because it's five weeks, I was able to choose the ones. And, and I have other ones that I've developed um, that I'm able to pull them in as I, as I want to change the course or as if something that comes up that may be more applicable, like maybe I want to use music in love, or maybe I want to use music in war this coming summer, you know, maybe because of the things that have just happened in Paris, um, I'm able to incorporate those and switch, switch them out. Um, so for each one of these modules, and I'll show you one here, um, here are my learning goals. So the students um, have, uh, I choose the reading assignments so it's not the entire chapter. Um, there is a slideshow on each one of the topics and then I choose the musical examples. So here's what I've chosen for this particular 
for this particular topic on music and ethnicity. And then for each one, they have a forum, an introductory forum, a quiz, um, a listing journal, and then assignments. Um, so due to the structure of the chapters, I can pick and choose um, uh, which of the sections and repertoire and cover, and I rarely cover the entire chapter. Um, the style variety in each one of the chapters um, allows for more room for students to write well about a style with which they are familiar. With that success, they then apply that use of terminology to styles to which they are less familiar. The listening journals are the most challenging piece of this class, um, and I require that students write at least 150 words using repertoire that they do uh, use in the first, uh, that they learn in the first module. So I do have a music fundamentals um, module. Um, and, um, and I have the expectation that their musical descriptions will increase with in sophistication as the course progress, progresses. Um, throughout each of the chapters, Nopig and Cornelius provide prompts that allow for students to include their own experiences into the conversation. And I use these prompts or tweaked versions of these prompts um, to, uh, to start the conversation. So here's one that pretty much comes basically from the Nopic te text about ethnic background and getting students to think about their own ethnicity. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, the chapters also include prompts that can be expanded into larger assignments. Um, and that tends to be the, the place where I expect students to incorporate all the things that they've done here from, from the listing journal and from the quizzes that they've taken and from the forums that they've interacted um, to be able to more sophisticate, be more sophisticated in their writing. Um, so that with the expectation for, for these, one of these assignments, and I have three here that they can choose from, they have to write 250 to 500 words um, in response. Um, and uh, again, they have to be much more detailed. Um, so for this course, multiple, cho mu multiple choice tests are not the focus. It's these larger assignments that are more of the focus. And usually the last module that I use is either the music in film or the music in concert, where the student will have to watch an entire film and write about the music, and, and it will be a much larger writing assignment, or I have chosen a concert or two or three for them to watch. And there are some really high quality ones that you can have them watch and ask them to write a sort of concert review of that. And that music and concert chapter at the end of the book, um, there is a lot more sort of uh, larger pieces from which to choose to write about uh, for the listening journal. Um, I teach another general education course um, at um, Appalachian in Music and Gender during the spring semester face-to-face and online during the summer. And I've never used a textbook for that course and I've always or organized it topically. Women in the Blues, Rock and Masculinities, Pussy Riot and the Riot Girls, um, and the reading and listing come from for a variety of sources. And I found this to be a successful structure and a successful structure overall for dealing with the general population of students. Um, an appreciation textbook that provides me with the same kind of structure and provides me the instructor with a choice matches my pedagogical conception for my Gen Ed classes. All right, at this point, we have 45 minutes left, which is a luxury um, for conversation. Um, I want to very, I, I realize I probably should have not introduced everybody at the beginning as people came and went. Um, we have, again, Mary Nafik speaking as Jennifer Hun, Chris Freitag, uh, Rowan Wallace, and uh, Reeve Schulstadt, who are our four speakers. Um, at this point, I think we can see if the microphone in the middle works. It's also a small room, so if you want to speak loudly, my guess is that will be sufficient, or maybe not for the recording. Okay. Um, so are there any questions or comments? Anyone would like to start with? Uh, please. And if you could introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm Sarah Adams. I'm intrigued by the last talk and wonder how large are your classes? Um, with our online classes, we were pretty, um, but with my colleagues that had done this before, they had strongly suggested that we cap it at 25. Because I'm thinking of your reading responsibility when you have all of these. 
It is enormous. It is enormous. With the listening journals, the way in which we use Moodle, um, and the and the way in which Moodle sets up to, you know, you can scroll through their reading assignments pretty quickly. So the technology helps speed it up a little bit. But it is an awful, an awful lot of reading. It really is. So it is very time consuming. But I like the structure because I have been, I felt like I've been very successful over the last two summers doing this. So. Uh, I'll just see from here. Colin Ross, University of Kansas. Chris and Robin, I was especially interested in some of your comments about the market driving the textbooks. And what was in the back of my mind as you talked about that was how in K through 12, uh, there's so much talk about the Texas State Board of Education. How many textbooks? are under their single decision how they're the largest market and therefore drive many of the textbook decisions at that level. Is there any kind of a trend in terms of certain regions, geographies, types of schools, or anything like that that drive these textbook decisions in the music appreciation market? Chris, you may have the best idea. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question, and unfortunately we don't have situations like Texas yeah. uh, to deal with. There, there is really not, um, in my experience, a regional breakdown, and there's even not much of a breakdown between, let's say, two-year schools and four-year schools or liberal arts versus research universities, because across all of those environments, the general education student population tends to be sort of more similar than they are different. Um, and, and I think very much it's the choice of textbooks uh, comes down to where the instructor comes from. It's the instructor profile, and you can find people teaching in two-year schools and high-level research universities with you know, the same, essentially the same backgrounds. Uh, so there's really not um, that kind of thing happening. Now, what, what is starting to happen, though, and it will be interesting to track this development, is that where states are becoming involved, for instance, in California with the Open Resource Initiative, I think we're starting to see state legislatures try to take more of a hand in the textbook selection process. This is starting to happen in New York as well, mostly around the issue of cost and trying to find um, sort of lower cost or even free alternatives for textbooks. That's another entire topic of discussion that we can certainly get into, but in terms of regional impact, that's the only thing that I see on the horizon. There was a question back here. Oh, yeah, I have one for uh, Reese the online course. Um, I teach kind of a hybrid school of online courses of mine, a really, really large section. Do you use the online component with books, with the design that you have? Um, I know a lot of the books that I have seen that use online components, and sometimes you can't even buy a hard copy, which is... Helpful. I don't. I really, um, because I like to put my own voice in it, and I like to respond to things, you know, sometimes in the moment or sometimes as I'm developing, the course for that particular semester, I tend to put that together myself. Um, they buy like a hard copy of the book? Yes, the students buy a hard copy of the book and they um, and buy the, have the CDs. Um, I also have a YouTube channel and it's another way to maybe to look at other um, uh, uh, versions of the recordings and I can connect to our online Naxos and Smithsonian Folkways, you know, if I want students to listen to a variety of performances. So I utilize all of those, um, but I have I don't use the, the online components that come with the books because I think I might have to say a little something about my own dealing with needing the power or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But um, I really enjoy that design piece of it, so I don't use that. Matt Baumer from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, Regarding the comments we were making about the, the market before, is the market for this book the people who teach it, essentially, right? And the people who teach music appreciation, as has already been alluded to, are by and large performers, are they not? I think that's not true. I think, uh, judging from my experience, a lot of the people who end up teaching this course are, um, they may teach, a, they have a studio area, but they also need to do something else to fill out their load. Um, they are maybe adjuncts who are selected primarily for some other reason, not for their ability to teach music appreciation um, or, or intro to music. And those people are heavily invested in the classical music project. And so are most schools of music where these decisions are being made. So it, it's, it seems to me that 
that that's a, a major part of the market for this for this textbook. Yeah, I, I'm having an interesting experience this semester because I was asked to teach a course for an online music educate all online music education degree. There we have very few students this the first year, but I thought, well, what can I teach in music history on a week's notice um, that would be helpful to these students? And so I chose to teach something I'm calling the philosophy of music appreciate the philosophy and techniques of music appreciation, which includes public musicology. So how do you go out into the world and talk about music? Some of, most of my students are music educators, most at the high school level. And one is actually an, our, our adjunct harpsichord teacher who never got a master's degree, but is brilliant. And we're not privileging my textbook, I'm happy to tell you, but they do have to do a lot of articles reading about the history of music appreciation, and they have to review textbooks. And these students are shocked that there's a different way of approaching music appreciation. Absolutely shocked. And they're all, they're all loving Robin's book and different approaches to music appreciation, and they have never, ever considered that there was another way to teach it. And I wonder if it's not that people are invested in teaching classical music, but because the way we've taught them in music school, they can't conceive of it. And the alternative textbooks, you know, they're not the most prominent textbooks out there. So anyway. And just to expand on that a little bit, um, in two ways. One is that from surveys that I've done, the people who teach this course are drawn pretty evenly from the musicology field, the performance field, and the music uh, education field. Not a lot of theorists teach this course. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's just the way that it is. Uh, the, other thing, the other thing that we haven't really talked about, uh, Robin alluded to it a little bit, is the extent to which what gets taught in this class is defined by the institution. You know, if Jen were here, I would take issue with what she said in her, uh, in her statement about students coming to her class expecting it's not going to be about classical music. Because if you look at the Butler description in the catalog, it is about classical music. So they read the catalog, that's what they expected. That might not be what they want, but that's what the institution says they're going to get. So I think there are lots of ways in which people are vested in keeping this primarily about the Western canon. But even if we take that for granted, that the course is always going to focus on that repertoire, that still doesn't limit the kinds of approaches that can be taken to that repertoire. There are lots of ways of going at it. Although, as, as I said earlier, there does seem to be a, a requirement, and at least based on the reader reports we got in, in many schools, that does require, if not necessarily that the whole course go in chronological order, uh, that uh, it had a, as I said, a significant amount of historical content. Uh, Matt, you alluded to the ultimate paradox of this, that of course the people who are buying the book are the students, so they're the market, but the people who are choosing the book are the instructors. And I can tell you all that's the only reason any book still has a CD set, uh, <laughs> because uh, you're, you're selling it to instructors, not students. Uh, one other issue that I've come across is the nature of the adoption decision. At some schools, every instructor gets to choose the text that they're using, uh, and I think that's great. Uh, of course, that means, you know, little, little droplets in the pond, whereas if you can get one big school to adopt the book and force all their instructors to, uh, uh, to teach from it, uh, which is not something that I approve of in theory, but of course that's the kind of adoption that, uh, that publishers and authors are hoping for. Uh, I was gonna... Oh, so I was a question that students actually always read the course descriptions before they sign up. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, the gentleman. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm like Chris, I'm Richard Carlin. I've been editing music textbooks for uh, 30 years or more and doing these surveys, and, and, and Chris did a great job. Uh, I, I could repeat um, uh, verbatim much of what he said, but there were two things I wanted to mention that I've noticed in my travels around, uh, and I will use pseudonyms here for those to protect the innocent, but one part of my job is, and Chris's as well, is to go to campuses, talk to professors, find out what they want, what's going on, 
And I can't tell you how many times I've been told a version of this story. I meet with the chairperson at X School of Music, and I say, tell me about your, your department. And they say, well, we have a music appreciation course, and you know, it's really important because it brings our enrollments in, it supports everything else we do, without it, we wouldn't get our funding. And then I say, well, that's great, what book do you use? And the person will say, gee, I don't know. I said, well, who's teaching it? Uh, well, I'm not really sure, actually. <laughs> it this semester, this is verbatim. I'm not making this up. And, and as an outsider, I'm only surprised to hear that. You just told me that the, your department depends on this course. The survival of your department depends on this course. And yet you have no idea what's taught in it, what book is used, who's teaching. So, I mean, again, to sort of reiterate, publishers don't have a cabal. Chris and I don't meet in a secret chamber somewhere. <laughs> uh, as much as we would like to. Uh, rub our hands together and say, you know, we're going to go out and, and, and dominate the market with this approach. The second thing is I can't tell you how many times an author will come with a very innovative approach. I had an author who sadly has passed named Bill Duckworth. And we talked about a project that we were gonna call Music Eye Appreciation. And it, this was back when the iPad, you know, mm -hmm. iPod rather, first came out. And the book was gonna have alternate routes through it. So you could, you could teach the same content using any listening. And the student was gonna, it was a really cool idea. Every time we sent it out for review, the reviewers would whittle away at what made it music, just as Robin said. They were like, yeah, we like this idea, but you're treating rock as the equal as classical music. How can you do that? And so, you know, my bosses then at Megalopolis, where I was working at the time, were like, well, well Richard, you've got to tell the author to make this book more like every other book. And, and this, you know, again, as Chris alluded to, you guys ultimately do control through your reviewing, your class testing, your input, what we publish. The final thing I will say, the scariest thing to me is the value of intellectual content and whether we value it or not. Students buy $500 sneakers. People like me buy $800 iPhones. Don't tell me your students can't invest some money in a new book so the author benefits and in the music that we have to pay for so the musicians benefit. This stuff doesn't survive on its own. We are not Rice Krispies. You know, Rice Krispies, you can steal a box and probably Kellogg's will stay in business. I've been in this business as I said, 30 years. 30 years ago when we published the scholarly monograph, we sold 1,500 to 2,000 copies. Today, we're lucky if we sell 300. So when your library says, we're only gonna order the books that are read, why don't you tell them that a library is a repository of knowledge and you should have the books that are not read? And don't just assign a textbook, assign a real book. And don't tell your students they can buy an older edition, because Robin Wallace, think of him at home. <laughs> <laughs> Going, eating beans out of the can. <laughs> His knowledge and experience, if you're not, e-books are not cheaper to produce, it's the knowledge that is the value. And you guys have to teach that. If you want your book read, you've got to teach your students to read. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my spiel. Chris. Um, my name is Eileen Watabe. I teach at Colorado Mesa University, and I have a Dustin take note. Um, and I, this is not a question, this is a comment about um, what students expect and also about the ignorance of the department chairs. Um, <laughs> I, I have no clout whatsoever in my university, um, and I'm on a one-year contract, um, but I'm lucky to teach music appreciation to 
this year and used Robin's book for the first time. Um, and I submitted a change for the course catalog um, to reflect this text in the way that I am teaching it this year, even though I probably will not teach it next year. Um, and the department had said, oh, well, that's fantastic. I love it. Go ahead. Sure. We approved it. So um, even though I may not teach it again, um, I hope to pass on that course description and the textbook as well. And it will probably be happily accepted by, you know, the next oboe adjunct who comes in to, <laughs> to do it. And I, I just want to add a comment to that about, the, to, you know, there are departments that exist where the dean does know that, you know, who's teaching what. And um, the other colleague that I work with, who is a performer, uh, has, uh, has worked, Melissa Lesbines, who's worked very closely with Norton for a long period of time. And she's developed an online course too, and it's chronological. Um, but we found a way to share assignments and incorporate our university in it as well. Um, recording our ensembles, performing a piece or a concert, then that be the concert review that the students do. So there are ways that those two ways of teaching can, can work together. So I just wanted to make that comment. I think you should tell Missy to use the, my book because I went to high school with her. <laughs> uh, really? Uh -oh. Gee, I'm learning something. Uh, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, uh, is it possible for publishers to send review copies to music appreciation teachers who are not using a book? Because I think the faculty who are um, working on their own kinds of things are more open to non-traditional ways of going. And I also have to say, I've talked to a lot of pedagogy seminars over the last couple of years, and our younger musicologists are really into non-traditional textbooks. And as soon as they, I think, are into the mainstream, I think the non-traditional textbook will have a little bit better market. Yeah, I have a comment about that, if I could. So one of the ways that we'll get the oboe instructor or the other people that are not in this room who have no um, real experience in musicology to teach from the newer methods is when the undergraduate music history sequence changes as well. So that's my comment. We could discuss that. But I kind of wanted to return to this idea of how many contingent people are using these textbooks and ask the panel, especially those who have taken some kind of survey about who's using them, because I just heard one-third musicology, one-third education, one-third performer. That means only one-third, if we're luck lucky, even ever attends an AMS conference and is in on the debate about what we're teaching and how we're framing it. And I hate to say it, I have great colleagues that are teaching music appreciation, but I'm one of the few that has a, the experience in even thinking about how you frame a textbook. So I think it's a luxury for me to say, oh, okay, I can teach from any textbook because I'm gonna frame it in a specific way. I'm gonna bring in my own materials. I'm gonna bring in my own voice. And I hate to disparage others who teach from these books, but for many people, especially for starting out, when it's not their primary field of expertise, the book is their voice. And that's for a couple of years until they really develop a voice. So that's my comment and question about contingent faculty teaching from these textbooks. Well, one thing I would say in response to that is that um, this is not the or only organization where this conversation happens. So there have been sessions, there was a session very much like this at CMS last year with some, a broader umbrella in terms of performers and music educators and even theorists. Um, so your point's well taken, but I, I do think that there's a broader conversation that happens. Uh, the other thing, and, and others have alluded to this, and it goes to the whole departmental thing and some of what Richard was talking about, there is a significant proportion of people who teach this course who are adjuncts and often adjuncts at more than one institution. That raises another big issue because uh, on the one hand, they aren't really vested in how the course does at any given institution. They're very vested in how they do at the institution, so they want to teach the course that they feel comfortable with. And secondly, if you have to do more than one prep for this course, do you really want to use two different or three different textbooks when you're teaching at three different institutions? So that's another factor that often weighs in the selection process for, for people to do a lot of adjuncting. 
I forgot to say this anecdote. The chair of my department does know that we use Steve's in my book for the music appreciation classes, but I got an email a couple of weeks ago from the dean of the College of Musical Arts, who a friend of his from way back has written a music appreciation text and sent me uh, the PR and he said, you know, I think we should use these for our music appreciation texts. Please take a, or classes. Can, could you take a look at it? So I went in to see him. <laughs> I teach with Reeves at Appalachian State. Uh, maybe I'm beating the drum at the wrong place and with the wrong venue, and if you're at my institution, you hear me beat this drum every year. Uh, but I'm just going to expand slightly on the last couple of comments. In general, across our country, adjuncts are paid a criminal wage, and asking them to do anything extra is beyond the call. And so it certainly makes sense that they teach from the same book for 20 years. I think that somehow institutions need to provide them with extra development money. I think you can all go home and persuade your departments to do this. If they're going to have to use a new text, they need some uh, help in getting there because they're already living with a can of beans. Yes. I, I want to uh, return to the subject a little bit. I, uh, there's two things that I'm, that I'm thinking about. One is that um, while musicologists may be not the primary teachers of this course, we are probably the primary people who are going to drive curricular reform. So if, you know, the course description needs to be changed, that may well be the musicologist who's going to do that. And that is definitely within our power. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many of you work within curricular structures at your institution, but that's something that the permanent people who have the degree in the field should be taking on and should be leading. So, you know, if, if it's a matter of what does the curriculum look like that's holding this, this back, that's a place where we can certainly engage. The other, the other thing that's related to that, I would like to know how many institutions still have this course as their only fine arts requirement for the entirety of a student's undergraduate career. So at my institution, we have a liberal studies curriculum. You're required to take a fine arts course. You can choose art theater, music, or dance, and if you have my uh, music course, you know, is it really ethical that we would only provide one tradition or insight into one tradition of music for that course, that being the classical tradition? Um, when I arrived, I, I said no, and so I switched to a textbook that had a much broader variety of repertoire. Um, and, and I would just challenge all of us to really think about that. I mean, I, I understand maybe, maybe a lot of places have a menu where you can say choose, do I want the traditional classical course, do I want rock music, do I want world music? Um, I, I wonder if that's even a good idea, if that is the only fine arts course that a student is going to have in their college career, should it focus on one, you know, because that's when these messages that, uh, that Jennifer's paper raised, um, coming from the beginning of the history of this course, that's when those discourses get perpetuated, it's, it would seem to me. So I, I don't know what all of you think about that, but that, that'd be my, that's my ethical drum to beat. As far as the issue of musicologists teaching this course, um, in, in my experience, there are some musicologists, including some very senior people who absolutely love teaching this course and, and make a big priority out of it. Uh, there are others who are quite happy to have it taught by adjuncts and performance faculty and so forth because it's just not very high on their, their radar. Uh, so I just, I, I want to underscore what Matt was saying that, that uh, from, from my perspective, uh, this really is the most important class that any of us teach, not simply because it brings in enrollment, but for that very reason, that for many college students, this is the only course in music they will ever take. So it's an enormous responsibility. I also believe that it's extremely important for music majors to take music appreciation. Um, and I, I love that we're there in my class. It's not just for the general population, it's definitely for the music majors too. At Appalachian, we have more of a variety of classes that students can take for gen ed. So my music and gender class is one, our ethnomusicologist teaches a class on music of Cuba, music of propaganda, um, and so we have a bit more choice. And then 
along the same lines, we do have some music majors that are interested in those topics, some of them that want to go on to musicology, that take that class with, with our general ed students and have a, a different kind of experience. And it's really nice to be able to offer them that opportunity to go at it from another angle. And I just had lunch with a student um, yesterday who was finishing a master's in, in musicology, and he said the seminar style of the music and gender class was the most, one of the more beneficial things in helping him go on to seminar classes when he went to graduate school. So um, it is, although our gen ed program is quite an interesting nice word. Kind, <laughs> kind of uh, constantly changing <laughs> thing, it is nice that we are able to offer those different types of courses. Um, I'm not answering is Jennifer, but uh, um, when music history, or when music appreciation was music history light, we did not allow our music majors to take the course because we had the, the Burkholder. Um, but now we do because we have a variety, we do have a, also have a variety of course, we have introduction to classical music, introduction to world music, and then exploring music, which is kind of all of it, uh, popular music. So now we, we, our students can take those courses, and I think should. If I could maybe comment and ask a question. Um, I feel like I'm channeling Stephen Meyer in the sound of what I to say, which is, I think also when we're thinking about how we frame these textbooks, um, thinking about our conversations with our non-musical colleagues is often a challenge. Um, we talked, there was a, on the Thursday night session, there was a little bit of a conversation about the degree to which people do things simply because they're used to doing them. And you know, I teach at Beloit College, which is a relatively progressive liberal arts college, and yet, um, when I think about what my colleagues think that we do, they fall back on what they did in the 1960s and 70s. And, and so there's, where is your music appreciation course? Where is your world, no, where is where's their category of what it is that we do? And I think making an effort to educate our colleagues or have the conversations with our colleagues about the fact that we are not the mere entertainment is important. Um, along those lines and, and jumping off of, um, Jennifer's not here of course, but, um, one of the things that um, I took away from her talk, and I sort of put this as a question to both the panel and everybody else, um, is there any reflection on, on the fact that we still call these music appreciation courses? And I say, I know that some of the titles of the, of, the, of the textbooks have moved away from that, but it, that still carries the legacy of a kind of an elevated you know, culture that we gain by appreciating with our monocles and cocktails the uh, <laughs> can I can I start with that because that I think is a really interesting question um, you know when you look at course catalogs and again this is something that I in the course of my job do a lot of the course is rarely called mm -hmm. music appreciation uh, it'll be called something like introduction to music or music in the Western tradition or concert music or there are all sorts of ways of talking about it and yet colloquially that's that's what we all call it, music appreciation the real problem with appreciation, in addition to whatever kind of freight it might carry uh, linguistically, is that it's almost an impossible thing to assess. And one of the things we actually haven't talked about, but is, is a very big issue, uh, certainly for me, in looking at what I publish, is that increasingly departments across the curriculum, not just in music, are under lots of pressure from administrations to show both clear course objectives and clear course outcomes which immediately leads to a conversation about, well, how do you assess against those course outcomes? Now, if you're teaching an introductory psychology course, or even an introductory music history course, um, where there's a lot of factual knowledge that is, needs to be gained as a part of that course, some of your assessment is gonna be really clear cut. That does not work for a music appreciation course, or for an art appreciation course, or for an introduction to world music course. Because what you're really trying to do is to bring your students to an enhanced, and more informed listening experience than what you have to be able to assess is how they listen. And you can't do that with a multiple choice test. So for me, one of the most interesting things that, that we are doing, and I'm saying we collectively for publishers, is the various attempts that people are making to find ways to assess what it is that students actually get from these courses. If it is appreciation that we're trying to bring them to, how successfully are we able to do that, and can we show that? 
I just want to say I was very careful to make sure that the word appreciation does not appear anywhere in my book. Uh, if anybody finds any place where I slipped, please let me know. Yeah, I'd appreciate it, yes. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, you saw the way that my class was set up and my mentor is here. When the students write well about music, it re reveals the fact that they understand what's going on. And so the, the writing piece of that, even though it is pretty, it's pretty intense, it's where I know that they understand what is going on. Thank you, Douglas. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if there's any attempt to survey graduates at some point down the line and ask them which are the courses. Well, I say this for a reason. I was once bumped up on an airplane to the first class, I forget where, and sitting next to a guy who was not talking. He was a graduate of City College where I went, which at that time had an extraordinary music department of emigres who had been rescued from Europe. And he was an engineer, oh, not an engineer. He was something very successful, but there he was in the first class. And when I told him that what I did and that I was doing, he went into raptures about the one course. So I think it's worth asking students. Mm -hmm. and, and he mentioned a professor to whom my book is dedicated, actually, because mm -hmm. he was a very, something quite special. So teachers have that possibility, and students get it. You know, it's funny, I, I don't know of anyone who's done that kind of longitudinal study. It would be interesting, but it reminds me that for years my uh, my standard opening gambit question when I go out to talk with someone who teaches, I'm going to say it, a music appreciation course, is if you ran into one of your students five years from now at the grocery store, what would you want them to say about the course that they had with you? I, when, I was, uh, when I was teaching those poor unfortunate students at Temple University uh, back in the early 1980s, I was at the same time working at Sam Goody Records, which was the big record store in downtown Philadelphia. And in my second year as a graduate student, I had the wonderful experience of standing there one Saturday afternoon, looking around for customers and having someone who had been in my last year's music appreciation course come in looking for something to listen to. Uh, which was the highlight of my you know, short but, uh, but very, uh, very colorful teaching experience. Uh, you know, I think that that is, you know, one thing that I, that I want to say about this, and, I, and, I, and I, I hesitate to say it, but this, this is an important course for a lot of reasons. And I always get a little bit nervous when we start to frame this course with lots of political overtones. Uh, again, it goes back to what I talked about uh, in, in my remarks, that the students coming into this course, they don't know what you know, they don't have the background that you have, they don't necessarily have the same concerns. They, they're coming to the course for lots and lots of reasons. And the more that we try to load on to what this course, quote unquote, needs to be, I think the more complicated is the situation that we create. Um, so asking yourself that question, what do I want these people to be doing five years down the road that they're not going to do if they don't take this class? It's not a bad place to start. I was, I, I'm uh, coming in as an outsider from the outside looking in because I'm married to one of the panelists and I'm not a musicologist myself, but that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, listening to this as an outsider, it's interesting because this is a course that's kind of a blank slate that you can write anything onto. What the, the, the common denominator is that many non-music students take it. And uh, what happens in that course is what we hope they will carry into their future encounter with music. And is the most important thing, a knowledge of the Western historical roots of the music they'll encounter in the past? Is it an understanding of the elements of the music that they can then use to analyze music that they hear in the future? Is it uh, a broad exposure to a lot of different kinds of music so that they'll have a broader encounter with music in the future. And it seems to me that that's what we have to figure out what to write on the slate. <laughs> so, I, I, not we, I'm <laughs> outsider looking in, but it's kind of interesting from this perspective. It's you. Me? Yeah. Um, I've been teaching this course uh, in history of rock, history of popular music. 
um, for the last four years, and I always ask the students in the very beginning, what do you want to get out of this course? And then a hefty number of points on their midterm is given to you. What is the thing that has changed your life so far about this course? And then again on the final exam, what will you take with you from this course? And the answers really are varied, even though I have certain things that I'm doing. Like I know that I'm teacher, teaching in the history of rock and roll, I focus just a lot on the civil rights movements. I'm really teaching that, you know, through rock music. Um, with the history of music and Western civilization, I'm teaching about how music and culture are combined so I can address gender and race and the whole white male thing and get them to think critically about that tradition. And then I can still teach that tradition. So some of them come away with story here. Um, when uh, I taught this class several years ago, I'm actually not, well, I'm on leave this year, so I'm not teaching anything, but I have not taught music appreciation for a few years, uh, or intro to music, as we call it. Uh, I uh, hope to do so uh, when I get back from, from leave, but uh, when, I, when I taught it using the manuscript of my book several years ago, I, uh, uh, on the final exam, just as an extra credit question, I asked the students of all of the pieces we studied this semester, which is your favorite and why? Mm -hmm. uh, and somewhat to my astonishment, the overwhelming majority of them said, George Crumb's Black Angels. Uh, and many of them said, I never thought I would say this at the beginning of this class. I couldn't stand that piece. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure what that says about appreciation, about, uh, but what it, what it certainly says is that students may not entirely know what they want to get out of the course and that a, a good instructor can lead them there. Near the beginning of the conversation period, we approached the issue of open source textbooks and textbook costs. And I wonder if, if you see that movement as an enemy and a threat to the kinds of novel approaches that you're wanting that we should be pursuing, or if that is actually an opportunity to open things up more freely. So I'm coming from Towson University, where the University System of Maryland does indeed have an open source textbook initiative. Um, I have not yet found one that works, but I did take a trial run through the system where I drew readings from things like the Oxford Companion to Music, which is part of Oxford Music Online, where I selected all my own listenings using an access library. So I was at least trying to make use of products that someone at some point is actually paying for. Um, but it, of course, meant that the students had no cost whatsoever. As an instructor, it gave me a great deal of freedom to build the kinds of courses that we've been talking about, to do the things that your textbooks are doing, but of course, none of the financial um, rewards of that went in your direction. Well, yeah, the financial piece of it is, 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 is one side. And it's actually not the first place my head goes, though, when I start thinking about open source. I mean, there's a lot out there, and, and whether you're talking about things that have been carefully put together and vetted like the Oxford Library, or just sending students out to look at things on YouTube. I mean, the music is broadly available, it's ubiquitous online. So theoretically you think, well, if what I need to do is assemble a bunch of music and put it in front of my students, then that's going to be my music appreciation course. Well, of course you can do that. And you can do that in a way that you couldn't do that 10 years ago, and part of the reason that these books exist is not even so much for the book as for the recording package that came with it, which provided the kind of ready-made platform to teach a broad survey of music uh, for listening. But I think that what, what is the challenge of the open source movement is that doing material which is really good, which works really well pedagogically, is something that A, not everybody can do, because if everybody could do it, the textbook business wouldn't exist at all. It's hard to do, it's time consuming to do, and when you get into things like assessment, it's, it can be technically difficult to do. So it's easy to gather together a lot of material to put in front of people or to give people access to, to learn uh, in a whole variety of courses. But providing the right structure for that, providing the right kind of pathway through that, which is really what publishers do, it's not about printing the books, it's about 
all the stuff that happens before the book ever goes to press. That's going to be hard to do. Does it represent a threat? In a way it does, I suppose. Although I, the way that I think about this is, well, so in an open source world, what are the kinds of things that, let's say, a Norton or an Oxford could do that would, would help someone who wants to take that approach, that would perhaps give them the kind of spine that they need around which they could use open access resources to build a course? I, I think that there is still a, a role for publishers to play. But rather than selling a $100 textbook, perhaps we're selling you know, a $15 online access to some kind of content amalgamation system. I, I don't think we go away in, the, in, in that environment, but I do think that it changes the business practice. One other small note I'll make on that, uh, the whole ebook uh, question. If you want the single most effective thing that, that you as instructors can do to lower the cost of textbooks for your students is to encourage them to use the ebooks, uh, which are much less expensive. Um, and for us as publishers, it's a situation where everybody wins. The student pays less, we still get paid, Robin still gets paid. But, you know, again, when you put a big investment into anything, you know, if you buy a new house and it's the $300,000 house, if you tried to pay for that house on a one-year mortgage, you can imagine what your mortgage payment would look like. You know, we used to have a five-year mortgage on a, on a textbook in terms of the, the life of the edition, the life of sales. Now that mortgage is about a year and a half. So if you wonder why the books are so expensive, that's why. We're publishing an expensive work for what's still a relatively small market. Um, I, I couldn't be happier to see every student using e-books you know, starting next semester. And fortunately, a lot of them are doing it now. It's up to probably 25%. It's only going to get better. But that's the other thing that will help sort of compete with the open resource demand because it's essentially about price. Uh, yeah, I, can I just add a quick comment? Open source material on the web. I wish they would run a big disclaimer in front of every free website that said, this website is not free. Someone is paying for it. Whether it's mounted, the writer is paying for it, whether they're getting paid in money or not, there's actually something that's going into it. And I would say, why do you buy an iPhone as opposed to a $20 ripoff of an iPhone? It works better, right? It's more thought through. It's not the cost of what went into making. It always drives me nuts that people say, well, ebooks should be cheaper. There's no paper. Like paper was the determinant <laughs> of what it costs. That's not, as, as was just said by Chris so eloquently, um, what we try to do is add value. Ask Robin what his manuscript looked like 10 years ago as opposed to what the finished book looked like. And not all the things we did were horrible, I hope, uh, in bringing that from the manuscript to the book. So yeah, there's a lot of so-called free material out there. But the question really is, again, the survival of content and, and intellectual value and whether we value it or not. You could go to a free doctor and get surgery if you'd like. And, and I'm not against, you know, I'm not against people saying, yeah, we want to save money, but but again, <coughs> you're saying someone's paying the money you save at some point in the system, and at some point in the system it becomes impossible to support, just like turning the lights on at your university. If I could, uh, if we are at 12 o'clock and people have flights to catch, and I think I hope we can continue these conversations and the cab rides and so forth and so on, but uh, since I have the pulpit, if I could end with one thought and bring us back to the beginning, I wonder if we could just, and this is, this is gonna stop it here, I really like to go back to the comment that Jennifer meant, made at the very beginning about still taking an opportunity at this point to think about if we're still, even if we still call it appreciation or if we don't, there's still legacies of that, I think still in what we do. Thinking about, as she put it, um, you know, in some ways thinking about going back to the roots of our charge and trying to step back and think about what are we really trying to accomplish? What do we want our students to come away from? How do we situate that within the missions of our institutions? And um, I think there's some things to talk about. There. Thank you for a wonderful session for the panelists. Thank you all for.